Hello and welcome to Competitive Podcast, episode 19. We're going to talk about premiere events today. Uh, but with me today is just David. Hey. Hey. Yeah. Uh, so I sent out a call a few weeks ago, like a week ago maybe, for potentially new hosts, and I don't think anybody's responded yet. So I haven't resp- haven't heard any responses online. So hey, if you guys want to be a new co-host of Competitive Poppercast, just uh, shoot me a message and we'll we'll do a tryout or something. Anyway, let's uh, go ahead and talk about the news. The big news for Popper is Premier Events lowered uh, their minimum entry from 65 down to 33. Yeah, so now they're actually capable of firing. Unlike yeah. before where they uh, you'd, you'd get in the queue and you'd sit there and you'd be like, all right, it's at 30 with uh, 30 seconds to go. And then it just wouldn't fire and then everyone would leave and then there'd be a big thing in the chat about how much Wizards hates Popper. Because <laughs> yes. every time all the players would get really mad. Yeah, for sure. Um, but apparently Wizards doesn't hate Popper because they've, they've uh, reduced the number to a sustainable amount, I believe. There's enough grinders and players who like the format enough to just contribute to end up taking the time yeah. to, to doing it. So. Uh, okay, well, anyway. Yeah, that's uh, that's pretty good. We've I've seen it firing, the Premier Events firing about about 40 each, roughly. Yeah, so. which is actually great, because um, as I've talked about before with, like, the reasons why I don't think premier events are firing is uh, just the value wasn't very good. Like when you st- when they start firing at sixty five, you're like, if you're the average player, you're expected to lose money on it. But if it's like forty ish or so, your value is actually pretty reasonable. So it it's good. I, I think it just makes so much more sense for Wizards to lower it because they'll probably enough people will come in at the end to raise it up because enough people at the start will be like, ooh, I can actually have a pretty good shot at, at making money. This isn't going to be just a lot of popper, possibly for nothing. So Yeah. Um, what was it, though? The, the payouts changed quite a bit, though, right? Oh, they did? I didn't even know. Yeah, yeah. They're, um, the payouts changed a fair amount. It's uh, Now, it's uh, you have max amount of people who can enter at uh, 64, right? So what they did yeah. now was they changed the payouts for everything non-standard, I think, for Premier Events. And your payouts for uh, Popper Premier Events are uh, the only payout up to 16th place. Right, so... Oh, did they pay out lower than that before? Yeah, yeah, they used to pay out top 32, I believe, and I'm going to check that oh. out before I... Well, I think it, I confirm. it's pretty yeah. understandable that they would <laughs> that they would reduce it to, to that. And I guess wherever the payments are right now, I feel like they're about as reasonable as they should be. I don't know. Like the yeah, fact yeah. that I, I mean, you can, if you, basically if you're in the top half, you get your money back. And then if you're in the top eight, um, you're actually making money, and so it's like, you know, I, I guess I sort of expect that in a tournament, if if I'm in the top half, I should probably get my money back, roughly. That seems about right. Yeah. So, it, it's, whatever it is, whether or not it's good or bad EV, it's close enough where I think people are like, you know, this is reasonable. This is worth my time. And they reduced a round, too, which I think actually is very helpful. Uh, yeah. Uh, by doing this Restriction of players. Yeah, yeah. They, it's a ma- it's a max of six rounds of Swiss. That's pretty nice. Um, yeah. Uh, so the the, um, the payouts are a little bit different than your standard event than your standard premier events, but uh, it's fine. Like the the events are firing. I would prefer to not have to play six rounds, but uh, well, it's what we got. So let's play it. And uh, you know, I top three one. So <laughs> yeah, congrats to you. Yeah, thanks. How many did you do? Uh, I did two. I did the one on, uh, I think, Saturday morning, and then the one on Sunday morning. 
And uh, Saturday morning I won two dropped, and Sunday morning I uh, I ended up going five one in the Swiss and won the uh, won round one of the f of the of the uh, finals, lost round two. Uh, so yeah, it was pretty nice. Got twelve packs for that, you know. Yeah, that's pretty good. I mean, that's uh, I don't know Theros. It's like thirty. So you put in entry of twice. So you made ten tickets throughout this weekend. Oh uh, yeah, I made I made a fair amount more than that, but not playing, not playing popper. Popper I played. You know, I made that much. Been breaking pretty even in popper. Um, yeah, you know, been playing mostly been playing Delver, but I've also been you know, playing various other decks when I get sick of Delver mirrors. Uh, been yeah, that's. What a lot of this is these days. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's pretty pretty much a pain in the butt. How, what have you been playing? Well, I got to play two premier events this last weekend. Um, I don't know how sustainable that number will be for me uh, in the long term, but it looks like uh, last weekend and probably next weekend I'll be able to do two as well. Uh, this weekend, maybe just one. But uh, they... Uh, are long enough and fun enough where I decided I'd stream one. So I, I streamed one, and I think you watched that. And in both tournaments, I played uh, Azorius Skitty. And in both tournaments, I top 16, which was kind of a disappointment because I wanted to top 8, you know, really badly. And um, in one of them, I basically was in contention to top 8, and then you were there when the ob obulet bug prevented prevented yeah. that from happening for me. I tried to blow up my opponent's obulet because it was the best line. It really was. Like best yeah. line was blow up well, his obulet, hope the bug's fixed, get my guy back, and then I'm probably 50-50 to win, I felt like. But if if I don't blow it up and don't get my guy back, I'm probably like, you know, I'm like 20% to win. And if if I don't do that line at all and just go a different route, I'm probably like 30% to win. So I just felt that the best the best course of action was, you know, blow up the ovulet, hope the bug's fixed, gain my life back, and then try to uh, go from there. And unfortunately, cards didn't work how they were supposed to, and so I, you know, couldn't pull off the 80% the to win at that point I needed and ended up getting garyed out, even with the Circle of Protection Blackout. I, the way he was playing, I could tell he, he had like a Gary train going yep. in his hand, so it was really unfortunate, but if uh, if it, that it, guy lands, it's huge. I say, it affected the way that you played the rest of the game, right? Because you had a, um, a Core Sanctifiers, so it was basically, it was one extra white mana for you to blow up the Obliat, or the Obliat, and yeah. uh, you know, you get your Lone Missionary back, which is what was exiled with the Obliat. And when you got your Lone Missionary back, you gained four life, and then you could you had like a handful of Dream Stalkers and Core Skyfishers that you could bounce the Lone Missionary back and not get carried out. Um, so yeah, it definitely affected you know, the way that you were going to play out the rest of the game and the rest of the of the event itself. So uh, you know, I put. People some, put some people on blast on Twitter about that, like, hey, uh, you know, this is your premier event, and you have a major bug here, which prevents somebody from going in the top eight. And by the same realm, uh, you know, Caravex Torch is still broken. You can still counter it for <laughs> for a blue blue mana without having to pay the extra two. So uh, these are both major bugs that are affecting cards that see play in Popper, and we need to petition people to get these fixed. Well, word on the street is, uh, and the reason why I saw this was, uh, so the guy who beat me was Megaphone, yep. and he, uh, I just kind of went to his Twitter just to see like if he said anything about it or whatever, and apparently earlier in the day, he, it, it sounds like he kind of just picked up Mono Black that day and like wasn't really dinking around with it, or if he had, uh, no one's blown up his Obulet, because m apparently in like a about round one, someone blew up his Obulet, it didn't work, and he pinged. Um, Worth on it. And so Worth said back, you know, like, well, I have heard that they're actually in the works of fixing this bug. So I do think a bug fix is coming for Obby that uh, it didn't come fast enough for me. And yeah. the, the frustrating thing about it, too, and you were 
listening to me like talk about this is that so we're <laughs> with where Theros packs are um, you it's three dollars per pack or yeah three dollars per pack to sell and you get three packs to uh, if you top 16 and so if I filed for compensation on the event and I don't top 16 I get 10 tickets <laughs> but if I but because I did so well, I got three packs back because I still like basically next round I just scooped because I mean me and my opponent both knew we top sixteen and there's nothing we could do to really improve our chances. Yeah. Um, so we both we, I just scooped him and I got top sixteen and so by doing so by not falling out of top sixteen, I ended up losing a ticket to their compensation request. So it was pretty. It, it was like. Uh, a double kick in the butt on that one, so <laughs> it's pretty brutal. But you know, ultimately, uh, my grievances aside, it was a really fun events. Both of them were. Uh, the second one was even more fun. Um, I battled back to a three and three and got like I was uh, two and three going into the last round, but I all three of my opponents were in the top eight, so I had like really good breakers. And I just decided to play it out, won my last one, and then I slipped into the to the last spot or second to last spot. So, so that's just uh, some words of advice to those out there: is you know, play it out because people are dropping all the time. Yeah. And you never know who your opponents were, and that's a huge, huge thing. So three and three can get can get you there, and if you go five hundred an event and get packs back, that's surprisingly good. You know money back yeah so and, uh i said that was the same event too where i played against you in round one yeah you beat me yeah i beat you in round one and ended up in you know top eight so that was i was one of your tiebreakers which was nice yeah and jack sad was the other and then uh what an affinity player uh yeah uh vagar i think yeah vagar, vagar. i normally like the affinity matchup but i just you know sometimes you get shuffled that's yeah. just what happens. Yeah, you got pretty flooded in that, I thought. Right? Was it flooded yeah. or screwed? Flooded one game, screwed the other? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, yeah, uh, but... and usually in that matchup, I can handle having one of those happen, but I mean, you can't. If you have back to back games like that, it's just. It's hard to be. Yep. Alright, so uh, moving on. There's uh, Born of the Gods spoilers. Anything caught your eye? Um, well, they haven't really released very many commons. I think there's less than ten right now that have been released. Um, the only two that seem like, you know, someone might play with them is the Nyxborn Shieldmate and the Boris Coast Sun Guide. Yep. The, sh the Shieldmate's a 1-2 for a, a Plains. He's an enchantment creature, a human soldier. And he's got Bestow for a Plains and two Colorless. And then he holy strengths the guy, so he gives the enchanted creature plus one, plus two. Um, I don't think this guy's like exceptionally good, but he's a, he's a soldier, which is relevant in, in Popper. He can help turn on your War Falcons or whatever. Um, his versatility is nice. Versatility is always a really underrated aspect of the card. And sometimes a card that does two different things is much better than either one of the halves. So, you might be better than the appears. Um, but I, I don't, I wouldn't, I'm not excited about him, even even though I said that. And then the other one that's slightly better, and I think we'll actually see a tiny bit of play, I would not be surprised if this makes somebody's list at some point, is uh, Horus Coast Sun Guide. Um, he's a cat monk, he's a 2-2 for a planes and a colorless, and he has the new mechanic Inspired. So, Inspired is... Whenever something gets untapped, some ability happens. So, uh, whenever this guy becomes untapped, you gain two life. And in an aggressive deck, like your guys are going to be untapping all the time. Um, but I've also seen some people dink around with, uh, I think it was a Field Marshal. You know what card I'm talking about? No, I don't know what Field Marshal is. I'll look it oh, up. Maybe, maybe it's Field Surgeon. I have seen Field Surgeon before. I think it's Field Surgeon. Yeah, I always get the, those cards mixed up. So Field Field Surgeon says it's a planes and a colorless for a 1-1. One, one. 
Tap an untapped creature you control. Prevent the next one damage that will be dealt, dealt to target creature this turn. Well, this is actually a very good card. Uh, you can just start tapping your guys left and right, making them prevent it, but uh, it, it prevents like burn damage to them and whatnot. But it's also a good way to, to make your guys tapped so that you can untap them later. Um, I've seen a few brews. There's a merfolk that's like a 1-2 for 3 mana. And whenever it untaps, you put another 1-1 one, one Merfolk token into play. So, the untap Field Marsh Field Surgeon deck is, you know, a tier 4 strategy right now, but maybe with enough ins inspired or inspiration cards or whatever those are, you'll uh, be able to make this deck at, take it up to the next level, possibly. So, I mean, that's, that's the brew route I would look to. But this guy is, you know... A bear with an upside, and those do have homes and poppers. So um, yep. maybe Oros Coast Sun Guide has a has a shot. Have yeah. you seen any cards? Uh, yeah, the Oros Coast Sun Guide is the one that I was particularly calling out um, because it's a very good sideboard card uh, against like Burn or uh, or actually even Delver because you know you as the Delver player you kind of have to count on this guy right because you can't really uh, two life gain per turn is kind of hard to beat. Uh, it's not incredibly hard to beat, but it's, you know, it makes things more difficult. So, And if you start combining this guy with a uh, Springleaf Drum, then his text reads, you know, gain two life every turn. So, yeah, that's something you definitely have to consider whenever you're uh, playing this guy. White Weenie is, is very good against Delver because Delver can't handle, life gain, can't handle large amounts of life gain and um, you know, large consistent amounts of life gain, and you kind of don't want to counter him, right? You want to save your counter spells for things like Core Skyfisher and uh, other things that are hard to get rid of, like Bone Splitter. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I think I can see this guy making a splash of White Weenie, but yeah, I think he would have a much better chance if he had a more relevant creature type. Yeah, yeah. if he was a soldier or something like that, I would actually, I'd, I'd be, I, I'd expect him to see some play. As it is, because he's like a cat monk, um, I, I'm not. A, I wouldn't be surprised if he saw play, but I'm not expecting it. Yeah, it's it's unfortunate that he's a cat monk. There's a theme of cats in Born of the Gods, apparently. Yeah, <laughs> they always pop up at random points in time. Yeah. So we talked a little bit about what you've been playing. You're mostly on Azorius. Have you been playing any uh, two mans or eight mans? Uh, I play a lot of two mans, like a lot of two mans. I seldom play eight mans, um, but I play a lot of two mans because I think they're they're good testing, and sometimes I like a little bit of competition in my testing. You know, it, it feels more like I want to win, like I actually care, and I'm more invested in the game. Yep. Um, so I play a lot of two mans, and so. In that, I've been just doing a variety of decks. I always do. I mean, I I have sort of a testing approach, which is, you know, start off in the tournament practice room. Once the deck, like, performs at the level I think is somewhat competitive, I'll bring it over to the two mans. And so I actually haven't been finding too many decks that I've been, like, ultimately excited about. And so as of late, I've really just been testing, like, decks I've already had in the two mans. Um, I did play one eight-man randomly, um, the thing that'll get me into an 8-man, really, is if I'm in the situation where I walk into the tournament room, and I'm like, oh, you know, I have a lot of time to kill. Oh, and there's six people in the queue, or five people. It's pretty much five or more, and if there's five or more in the queue, I'll jump in. And uh, I did one, and I, I won that. Um, that was pretty nice. Yeah, it was, it was convenient. Um, but yeah, I've really just done one. They're just... I've actually... You know, I've had the same thing as you, where you jump in one, you forget you do it, you know? it's, And then it's like you're in the middle of like double queuing somewhere else, and suddenly this match pops up, and you're like, <laughs> oh, God. I signed up for that seven hours ago, and here it is. <laughs> yeah. I've had so, that before, too. Yeah, so I, I just try to stay away from them. Um, I... I don't really think that they're, I mean, they're bad value, you know, and they're, to me, an eight-man is for testing, and 
for testing alone, but as time has gone on, they've decreased in competitiveness. Like it's almost like everyone now thinks all their forest testing. So all you're testing against is other people's test decks. And so it's it's not very useful. Yeah, uh, right. It's like that or you run into Delver. So if you want to test against Delver, I mean that's that's <laughs> fine. Yeah. And and it seems like you'll you're running into a lot of Esper Sage decks, but I think it's really just that there's I think Esper Sage is just very well poised to beat random road decks. And I think it's fine against a lot of other stuff, so the yeah. same three Esper Sage pilots you see every day in the Ants too, so you might run into them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, there's the the Esper Sage guys are guys who are always playing that deck and will always play that deck, you know. Raging Flump and um, there's a few others. I can't remember the other ones, but uh, yeah, those the, the, these are the guys who are always you know. If I see this guy in the queue, in the in the queue, then it's like, well, he's playing Esper Sage. You know, I know I know that one's a pretty good matchup for me, but I think Esper Sage is there to like sort of combat um, Tron, right? Because Tron seems to be seems to have made a small comeback, and Tron really can't beat Esper Sage at all. Like it just seems highly unlikely that they're ever going to do it. I think I saw someone do it in one of these tournaments actually, but that's beside the point. <laughs> but yeah, I agree because I don't think it's a very good matchup for them. Yeah, it's it's going to be a pretty hard matchup for them unless the, unless the Esper player like floods or you know the the Tron player you know fires off their power blast ex exactly the right moment or something like that. They're just not likely to win against Esper. So anyway, I'm not I'm not an Esper pilot. I've played the deck before, but uh, I've played Tron before, and I can tell you that Esper is definitely not a good matchup from the Tron perspective. Yeah, uh, I think Esper has a good matchup against a lot of the field. I think it beats Mono Black. I think it beats most of the um, fringe decks. I think it also, I, I think it it fifty fifties a lot of the other matches. Like I'm pretty sure that. Uh, Affinity, I mean, Affinity can beat it. It does beat it, but it's not like auto win for them or anything like that. And I feel like that's sort of the same with Delver. Like, Delver can beat it. Um, it probably does beat it more often than not, but it's not an auto win. Yeah, definitely and not an auto win. when you have such... But for them, they have a lot of auto wins. So, like, I just cannot envision... Like, Mono Blue Control, I just don't think can beat familiar myself it just doesn't seem possible well i mean mono blue control needs uh needs the turn one delver if they don't have the turn okay. one delver then it's gonna be very very hard to beat esper sage yeah it's got to be this like tempoing yes aspect of it and so it, they have a lot of like basically free wins yep. and uh when you have a ton of free wins and somewhat percentage matches against everyone else like i think that's a good enough reason to play it the problem with it is it's a hard deck to play with a lot of clicking, and it's really boring to play. Like, I was <laughs> fiddling around with the version with Urza Lands, and I showed it to you, and I think the deck was actually, like, okay. I just stopped working with it, because I just don't want to win with it. <laughs> like, when I'm winning, I'm like, this is the worst. <laughs> yeah. Alright, so, <laughs> let's get on and talk about our uh, premiere events. Uh, so we've got the first premiere event that we're going to talk about, and this is the first one that was listed on Wizards' website. Was uh, the winner was Jack Sad? He won with uh, he won playing the very aggressive version of Delver, which is the sixteen island version. Uh, so what you think about that? Uh, well, it's got to work for him. He uh, continues to win all the time. So <laughs> um, in the last like. I think he's pretty recently new to Popper, and he wins all the time. Yeah, I don't. I, I'm not sure if he's how new he is or whatever, but yeah, he's he's utterly crushing with this deck. And you know, I tried out this exact copy of this deck, and I can't win with it. It's uh, I always end up mulliganing myself into oblivion because I think the land count is still too low. So I took this deck and I made some changes to it, including upping the island count and getting rid of Cloudfin Raptors and Bone Sweaters. And so we'll talk about my deck a little bit later. So well, he's really wins. aggressively, though. Like, I, I mean, when I played against him, um, uh, like when I play against, like, Mezzle or something like that, 
they finish the game with like a lot of cards in hand. They barely ever tapped out. You know, it's um, it, it's really quite a controlish feel. Um, while I'm getting beat up, but this guy, he tapped out all the time, played all his dudes out there really quickly, and by the end of the game, I mean I I think it. I lost to him 2-1. I know I beat him one game. He crushed me the next. And then in game three, it got to a point where if I can resolve a spell, I win. And he has no cards in the hand. So he untaps, passes. I cast something, he counters it. And then I have, like, another turn. And so I pass. He draws. Uh, pass says go. And uh, I play something else, and he counters it. So he, like, had to back-to-back counter me off the top. Yeah. And I haven't really seen that play style. It's, like, very rare I ever see Delver players get down to no cards in the hand um, in the middle of the game. Like, I see it, you know, I turn, like, 10 or 12, but yep. when I've exhausted the resources. But it was kind of surprising. So he's yeah, a different style player. It's uh, Maybe that's how I was, pl- well, I was playing this deck wrong. <laughs> maybe I'm supposed to tap out and throw all my spells away. It may have just been his best lines in those instances. Yeah, that's probably that, that could be true too. But I, you know, I disagree with the sixteen lands. I think it's too few, and so that's what I did with that deck. In second place, we've got a is it control, which is interesting. Maybe and I'm going to write an article on my thoughts on this deck next week. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, yeah, it has to. I mean, it. I'm working on sort of a. Well, not really a theory. It's, I mean, I guess it is a theory, but it's something like everyone does all the time when they build decks, uh, and limited and whatnot. But um, there's, a f- I think this deck is it's really new, um, and it's got a few holes in it. I think because it's a little rougher on the edges, and so yeah. I'm going to try to improve upon it oh, by using cool. some theories. That's cool. Yeah, and it, this deck seems like it wants to be like it doesn't know if it wants to be tap out control or counter control. That's my biggest problem with it. I think that is exactly uh, my original problem with it. The first lists I saw were like really gross in that regards. Like uh, they had accumulated knowledge and compulsive research. Yeah. And it's like accumulated knowledge is a card I can get behind in like Rick P. Delver, where it's like a controlish Delver where they're always leaving two mana up, and so you don't play something they want to counter, end of turn, they'll accumulate knowledge. Maybe they don't draw a bunch, but, you know, over time it amounts up to something. I, I don't see, like, any reason to play accumulated knowledge and compulsive research in the same deck, because yeah. you're... Like, when would you ever do that? Like, turn five is the first turn you can hold, like, compulsive and hold up accumulated knowledge. It just seems yeah, really And this is, like, slightly progressed progressing in the direction I like, but it still has some issues along those lines. See, and I still like accumulated knowledge over compulsive research in this list. Uh, I might too. I, I'm not, I don't really care one way or another if you're going accumulated or compulsive. I just don't like them both together. Yeah. Alright. In third place we've got Affinity. And, uh, you know, that's Affinity. We really need, like, we really need an expert on the show on, on Affinity. Somebody who plays it a lot. Because <laughs> every time I play Affinity, I just lose. So there's a couple of decks like that. I feel like uh, it, the world would be better served if someone who likes to play those decks would like step forward and like talk about them more. Yeah. And Affinity is one is one of those. I mean, there's so many people playing Affinity at all times, and yet I see so little written on them. You know, nothing is yeah said about it. Uh, I feel like it's a deck that has more play to it than I'm seeing. Like, in mean, my basic gist of how I see Affinity is uh, play things, turn them sideways, and then Perilous Research and Thought Cast into more things and, you know, eventually win that way. <laughs> yeah. I think the one thing to note is uh, his use of white in this deck. He's playing uh, four Ancient Dens for to splash his Journey of Nowheres out of the sideboard. Nice. Which is interesting, because you usually see that type of thing or black to splash Doomblade. Yes. Uh, maybe he's got tired of getting garried out or something? I don't know. Could be. But yeah, it's got to be in response to the mono-black matchup, but uh, it's something I haven't really seen before. Yep. 
In fourth place, we have Mono Blue Control, which is the same, pretty much the same standard list as what we've been seeing with Mono Blue Control. Yeah, uh, I actually, I played against this guy uh, in the second daily, and I managed to pull off a win against him. But his, uh, he, he plays pretty well. He plays, you know, the standard way of um, once they get up to two mana, there's not another turn you have where they're not drawing cards or countering something if you don't play some or. They're drawing cards if you don't play something and countering it if you do. So, yeah. so. Good. I like um, Mono Blue Control. It's a, it's a deck I've been playing a lot recently in eight mans. So it's a yeah, it's, it seems like he's running fewer counter spells than normal though. Uh, no, this is pretty standard nowadays. The normally we run four miscalculations, but he's running a prohibit instead of the fourth mis miscalculation, so he's running the same amount as normal. One, four, eight, so just 12? I always thought it was a lot more than that. Yeah, you think it is, but... Uh, <laughs> that's just because the, the deck is draw always drawing so many cards that they're always going to have... It seems like they're always going to have a counterspell, and then, like, Exclude can sometimes draw you a counterspell off the card. So what's the... And maybe you can answer me this. Why Seagate Oracle? That card, like... I love when my opponents play that against me, because that usually means that they're not going to play something else that or they're not going to hold up counter magic and so I have a turn to do whatever I want yeah there's a mainly it's to block ninjas and uh, goblins is the primary reason you play CK but I mean it replaces itself it's you know it digs too deep and fetches you a card uh, so overall it's just it's just a nice card to have so okay uh -oh. yep yeah standard list there. Yep. Uh, and then we have another affinity player in fifth. In sixth place we have Esper Sage. Misha from Popper Revolution. Shout out to Misha. And then in seventh we have Megaphone, as you were talking about earlier. Uh, interesting thing about his list is running Funeral Charms in it. Funeral Charms. Yeah, that's a card I've thought about. And uh, it seems pretty good. It seems better than the... Uh, um, piracy. Well, I mean, it's, I mean, it is piracy charm, right? But in a lot of ways, it seems sort of better in a deck like this because uh, all of his creatures can use it as a pump spell. Um, whereas in like Delver or something, it's kind of funny to play because half of your creatures will just die to it, so you can't pump them. Yeah. Um, and uh, it also also the discarding is just much more relevant with a funeral charm because. You know, you can get them down to Hellbent and then draw step, you know, charm them. Yeah. So it's, it's sometimes it works like a time walk, and it's pretty nice. It also combos really well with uh, Kumbai, which is yeah, uh, kill two toughness things. Um, if yeah, if you're expecting a meta of X ones, then it's probably better than Disfigure. Yep. Probably, but he is running four Disfigures too. So, like his list, I, I view this guy's list as pretty much like anti Delver list. Yeah. It's got the four disfigures, two funeral charms. Yeah, it's pretty nice. Um, and then finally in eighth place, we've got uh, the ultra greedy Tron deck, which is running no colored mana sources, uh, lands, I should say, by Daniel CHL. Um, so what do you think about this variation of Tron? I've seen a few Tron players running this variation now. Where they're running... Uh, I guess I don't really see what the appeal is that much like I don't love the mana base in the other one so I can see why you'd want to get rid of it but to me the no land version is more just like look what I can do yeah. <laughs> look, how, look how greedy I can be uh, um, but uh, I mean the mana silex is cute I'm sure that this works it's just really like what do you do if they have ancient grudge yes you know That's you're good problem. totally reliant upon spheres and stars yeah, Sphere Stars, Silexes, and Prophetic Prisms are... I mean, he's got 16 mana-fixing sources. <laughs> so, uh, it's working for him, obviously. Yeah. I just wanted to get your opinion on that. Um, but I do love his Rest for the Weary in the sideboard. That's a very nice card to have against Burn. Yeah, I saw um, Peter Runs Magic or whatever had three as well. He had the white tech, too. I guess I just haven't been paying attention. Oh. 
Alright. So there we go. For we'll go to the next one. For the next one, we have an Affinity player placing in top in the first place. Uh, I did watch replays of this. He didn't actually place in first place. They split. So that was sad. So we've got Affinity, and then we've got uh, in second place, we've got another Is It Control deck. So, you know, Is It Control has to be a thing, apparently. Yeah, it's the same list. It's like the exact. It's yeah, it's pretty much exactly the same. It is the exact 75. Exact same as 75. Uh, in yeah. third place, we've got Raging Flump on Esper Sage. Fourth place, we've got another Mono Blue Control, which is pretty much the same list that we already discussed. In fifth place, we have Hexproof. What do you think about Hexproof's place in the meta right now? Um, seems okay. I mean, I I guess I just don't really have an opinion on it. I mean, Mono Black is pretty low. Um, it has a fine Delver matchup. That I don't does. think it's, it's. I don't think it's like good or bad, really. No, nah, it's it's pretty good. It's it's an okay matchup, like right. It's um. For for Delver, it's certainly not a buy. You have to be very very careful and choose which things to counter appropriately. And sometimes they have hands that you can't counter the all the important things that they play. So they will win just based on that sometimes. Um, but to me, it's an inconsistent deck. I just don't really like like it's positioned very well because in a in a premier event because I just don't think you're gonna like you're gonna run into a matchup you don't like that happens to everyone you know you're gonna run into a matchup or two from meta gaming and that's about all the losses you can afford in a premier event is to run into your bad matchups and then you really just can't afford to lose to your deck and that's what happens here like they they have. Aside from, in fact, they're the deck that mulligans the most against me. Yeah. Because you have to have a creature, right? You have to have a hexproof creature, and you have to have, like, you know, the right mana and the right enchantments to throw on that hexproof creature. So you have very, like, you like five cards that you have to have in every hand. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And you'd think it would mulligan the same amount as in fact, but I think in fact just, like, it's just greedier on all aspects, sort of. Um here, because it's two color, they're like they understand that they need to add some lands and, and stuff like that. So it's you know, but regardless, I mean, whoever, whichever one mulligans more, they both mulligan a lot. And if you're mulliganing a ton in a six round event, you're gonna eventually mulligan yourself out of the game, and that's a free free loss for yourself every game you're signing up or every time you put ten tickets in. So I guess that's my biggest contention is it's just. It's not a consistent enough deck for me to to wind up to play it in a premier event. Yeah, it, it, like imagine that you're uh, every time you hit enter, you start off this premier event at zero and one. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and then you know, assuming you have to be at least four two to place in the top eight, then you know you start to lose some value there. Uh, all right. Yeah, so hexproof not not the greatest, but I mean, if you're comfortable with it, you know, like. Like let's say Deluxicoff, I wouldn't mind. I, I don't see you not entering if that's if that's the deck you're most comfortable with. Yeah, I mean comfort really goes a long way. If if you're comfortable enough to make it so that the rest of the tournament you go four one, um, then by all means go ahead and play your top eight. Yeah. But I mean it, it's it's that's a tall uh, ask. I mean that's a eighty percent win percentage. <laughs> Yeah, it's well, um, but yeah, it. I think it's actually pretty well placed right now. Uh, Mono Black seems to be dying down a fair amount, so the and the Crypt Rats number has been an all time low. So yeah, I think it's well placed. I just don't think I'd play it. I guess yeah, fair enough. In sixth place, we have a very interesting take on Mono Blue Control. Yeah, so. I played against this guy too at one point and. And uh, I don't know. I wasn't in love with his deck, but he did well. I mean, in in tournaments after I played him. So yeah, he's uh he's running the uh, what's his name? Channel Fireball Chris, guy, Chris, Chris Davis. Davis. Yeah, the Chris Davis variation of the deck, which has serrated arrows and snake forms and serum visions instead of you know better cards. <laughs> I think we've discussed uh, serum visions ad, ad nauseum before. 
Yeah. I, I mean, I just... There's a lot of, like, glaring choices in here that I'm really, like, surprised by. Um, I think the the biggest one to me is no miscalc, which is really strange and unique. But actually, I shouldn't even say that. That's not the biggest one. The biggest one for me is no Loomis Grace. Oh, like, yeah. That, that card, to me, is, like... The way mono blue closes the door on you, you know, you get to a point in the game where um, they have like six mana out and like three cards in hand, and you're like, okay, you know, I could try to go forth this turn and play like three spells, but what if those are all three counter spells? You know, and you're like, ah, I won't do it, and then they're like, Lunar's Grace end of turn, discarding land, Lunar's Grace end of turn, discarding land, and you're like, oh no, I missed my window. Yeah. You know, and then next turn you're like, okay, well now it could all be counter spells. So um, yeah, now, now it's me. definitely all counter spells. So I have to, I have to wait until he has like, you know, eight mana and like five cards in hand, and then I can slip in five spells <laughs> through his counter spells, right? Yeah, and it's a card you need one of in your whole deck. Like, it's not, it's not that big of a, of a impact, you know. So it's kind of strange to me that, that he does that, and he has a, a very like I'm seeing a much bigger emphasis in these mono blue control lists on managing the board. Than I have in a while. Um, back when these cart when this deck was like the king of the format. Back I don't know. This was years and years ago. So long ago. Uh, most people would it like the format was like goblins and mono blue control, and it was just a miserable format. But <laughs> some people really liked it. And that then it was just like their deck was just all counter spells and like spire golems. And I think that was it. Delver didn't exist, obviously. So it's just like horsepower golems, and they didn't have much of an emphasis on controlling the board. Um, yeah, but that's really gone up, which is interesting. Yeah, and you kind of have to, right? With uh, in the face of you know other Delver decks, right? That the actual the fairies decks, you have to be able to control those, and. Um, you know, weenie decks, which are weenie decks are just not very prevalent right now. I'm not really sure why, but um, they're not very prevalent right now. So you need to be able to control those, though, because you can't beat a swarm, right? Your spire golem can block a guy, but you know, if you're de- if you're at six life and they have four creatures on board, then the spire golems you're still going to die, even if you do land the spire golem. So I agree. Yeah. the The thing that I think is interesting, though, is that the swarm strategies just aren't present these days. Like I'm seeing this this downtick in counter magic in exchange for board presence. And the only thing I see that a value for is uh, like Delver is the only like sort of swarm strategy that, that exists. And I personally wouldn't really want a Frostboard, a weird Omen Speaker or a Seagate Oracle against Delver besides blocking ninjas. And uh, the rest, like those cards just seem kind of silly to me. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. That's fair enough. Um, I think they're necessary though because if you encounter things like Stompy, you're gonna want these blockers that they have to pump to get past. And you only have four Spire Golems in your deck, and if they're Ancient Grudging your, or Gleeful Sabotaging your Spire Golem, then you want alternatives. Yeah, I uh, I see the value there, but um, it's just interesting to note. I think that over time it's shifted away from, uh, like Drago to now they actually do tap out occasionally. Yeah. All right. Well, um, in seventh place, we have Deluxikov running the green one deck. Yeah, and to me, this is the type of deck I'd rather play over uh, Hexproof right now. I mean, it's because it is. I mean, I still think this deck might be too inconsistent for me to want to play it, and I did write about that. But it does minimize the amount of inconsistencies as opposed to Hexproof. Um, when you do assemble Voltron, it's not quite as powerful as it is in Hexproof, but um, you don't just auto-lose if you don't assemble it. And it's basically something he and I and you have been working on where we're trying to sort of fuse Stompy and Hexproof together in a way that makes it so that it's more challenging for Mono Black decks to interact with you on, and it's uh, your threats are like super versatile, and 
they're super cheap, so you can get under and out of Delver. Yeah. Um, and then once you have, you know, once you have a Bone Splitter, and a, he, a Deluxe Call opted for Flare Husks now in his deck. You know, once you have a couple of those guys out, then every single creature you play becomes a four something. You know, a four one or a four, four, four two. Sorry, I can't math right now. But and the flare husk is nice because anytime you equip it to another creature, then the germ token dies, and you can activate morbid on hunger with the pack. So you can make each of your creatures like potentially become a Voltron every time you draw a creature. So the deck's really. Really nice. I, you know, I played it in a premier, the, one of the first premier events, and I didn't do so hot with it. But I also ran into multiple affinity players, so <laughs> there was that. Yeah, affinity is probably the worst matchup. Yeah, um, you can still beat them though, which is kind of cool. Um, I think I'm fifty fifty against them, and the way you do it is you just load up your set, your ledge walkers, and your vault scourges with uh, hungers. Ideally, your your ledge walker because then they can't gal blast the yep. alt scourge out of the sky. But um, and then it's a race, you know. After that, so yeah. So that it's was pretty cool to see him placed in the top eight there. And then finally, we have another hexproof list. And uh, well, we've already talked about hexproof at ad nauseum. So let's move on yeah, to the next one. Nothing special in that list. In fact, it might be the exact same list. <laughs> so the third premier event. We have uh, Saru Cuckoo won the event yeah. playing Delver Fiend. And yeah. And who would have expected that, you know? Yeah. Um, I played this guy. This is the guy I lost to in the premiere event. This is the same premiere event that I placed in. So I played him in the top four, and we went to the third game on turn uh, 12, 15, 17, something like that. And he finally was able to sneak a kiln fiend on the board. He was at a very, very low life total, and uh, <coughs> I was tapped out attacking him because that was my best route of victory was to uh, attack him and pyroblast his uh, his dude or or not pyroblast hydroblast his counter spells or his uh, kiln fiend. I attempted to, and he pyroblasted. I spell started, he electricried in response to the spell started trigger, so he got me with the Kiln Fiend. So, yeah, his his list is very, very interesting because it's much more focused pre-board on control. Yeah, I actually really like it. I think it's, uh, it, to me, it illustrates, like, a lot, well, I mean, I've talked to you about this. This guy has been the Delver player, Delver Fiend player, since before Cyclops existed. Like, he's been bashing me in the face with Kiln Fiends for over a year now. And I actually just figured out that he's a Japanese player last night. I have a follower on Twitter, and he writes, too. So if you... It's hard to read him unless you know Japanese, but you can translate it on Google, and it's surukuku.diarynote.jp um, if, you, if you want to read it. And I'm... He, he, so he knows this this uh, deck list better than anyone else, and there's not very much in the way of uh, literature on this deck. Most people just are like, oh, it's a joke. But clearly it's something he likes to do and has been doing for a long time and has has had some success with. And so there's some kind of funny inclusions in here, like Piracy Charm. But to me, that just illustrates that here's a guy who knows uh, how his mana works in his deck, and that he's much more likely to have an excess island up than an excess mountain up. So he's going to use the removal spell that he can actually cast as opposed to a lot of other players who might just move to chain lightning there or something else. So um, I think his list is really indicative of a guy who's played this list a lot yeah. and has fiended people from all sorts of life totals. Uh, I, I think Piracy Charm actually has a really sweet interaction here in this deck in particular is the Island Walk ability. Right? Oh, like it has that. every mode on this thing is, is totally relevant. I mean, yeah. pumping your own guy before you assault strobe it? Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, so he's got that, and then Island I mean, Island Walk is super relevant, right? Because sometimes as an Elver player, I'm like, alright, well, you know what? I can leave back my, my Spire Golem to block his Kiln Fiend. Uh, I just need to make sure that I counter his evasion spells 
uh, you know, I, I need to make sure that I counter his, ar his artful dodges or whatever. And, you know, and then he, like, he has, like, three evasion spells in his hand with Piracy Charm. So, like, he has, uh, you know, the Shadow Rift, the Piracy Charm, and the Apostle's Blessing. And, you know, I can't counter them all, for one thing. Or, <laughs> so, or maybe I've, like, I've seen the, uh, the Apostle's Blessing so that I know I can leave back a Delver and a Spire Golem. And he can only give it protection for one thing and I have another, you know. So, like, Piracy Charm is just very nice in this deck. It also fights the opponent's turn one Delver. You know, you can just Piracy Charm and kill my, my turn one Delver. <coughs> so, all three yeah, modes are super active on Piracy Charm, which I really like. And he's got another Piracy Charm in the sideboard, too, to, for that very reason. Yeah. The interesting thing to note is his deck only has three Assault Strobes and ha doesn't have any um, of the commonplace... Uh, evasion spells, so he doesn't have the one you just mentioned, the flashback one, or the rebound one, which a lot of players play. Yep. Um, he's going solely with Shadow Rift, which is an interesting choice, because it's it's probably the one I see played the least of yep. those. Yeah, it uh, probably um, is. But, to me, it, I, I think it's one of the best, you know? Like, that's... Shadow Rift's the only one of those where if that's in your hand, but you don't have a Fiend or a Cyclops out, you can still like try to find the thing you need because you shadow rift your opponent's card, draw your own card, and then you can start digging to the pieces you need. The other ones are just like unless you're in a position where you're going to win right then and now, they're just dead cards. Yeah. And then also he's he's main decking dispels too, which is something I believe that all these people, sh all these uh, Delver Fiend players should be doing. Or yeah, I agree. They. Uh, I mean, they take care of Edicts, they take care of Doomblades, they kind of counter magic. Every deck that you care about, uh, Dispel is good against. Yeah. So, yeah, very, very nice list. I'll be playing with this list uh, next week, I think. That's when I'm going to be doing it for, for Pure. So, we'll ta I'll test it out. You know, despite my affinity for... Uh, I've mentioned before that I very much dislike this deck, but... I'm going to be testing it because I like, I like this guy's version of the deck, and it seems really nice to me. It caught my eye as, hey, this deck's actually pretty sweet. Let's check it out. Uh, in second place, we've got Tron, and this is the not-so-greedy version of Tron. I played against this guy in the Swiss, beat him pretty handily. I got lucky in game three, though, right? I mulliganed, like, to five or something, and I just drew all the right cards to beat him. So, so your luck evened out, you're saying. <laughs> yeah. Um, I I think he mulliganed in like game two or something as well. So down to it was only down to six, but it, it makes a big difference with Tron whenever they mulligan because like they just don't they don't really mulligan well. I don't think, uh, especially on their lands. Right, if they're stuck on one land for a while, they just lose. Yeah, I agree. Um, so they're yeah, still they're still running the Colony Garden, and I'm just still not a fan of it. <laughs> yeah, it's it's uh, too cute. I mean, I tried it when I was working on Blue Green Fissure Post, and it was in there for a little bit, you know. And I had a reason for it. It was to try to crop rotation into a blocker to be infect, you know, like snap a blocker out if they decide to pump, uh, and then F six. So like, I had a reason to play it, and it still like was bad. It just was not <laughs> worth my my time, and I see no reason to play it now. Like having a blocker is like, yeah. It, okay, but... It occasionally blocks a ninja, and that's about it. That's what it does. Um, it just doesn't seem like worth worth having an, a tap line to do that. Yeah. I totally agree. I hate Colony Garden in this deck. I'd rather just have a forest. And the other interesting thing is he's running cap size. Which is a... Yeah. Pretty, it's not something I see very often out of them, and it's kind of a difficult thing to cast in this deck. Yeah, it's gonna be very hard. It's gonna be very hard to cast in the stack. But he is running. I think the original list of these only had one island, or so maybe it's a little bit easier to cast capsize. But no, I can't see. I can't see him really consistently casting capsize there. I think I'd rather just have the the fourth ancient stirrings is what it looks like he cut, or the finger marauder, or mole drifter. Yeah. Any any number of these cards I'd rather have than capsize. Yeah, and it does look like he opted to remove a Mold Drifter for a Compulsive Research, because um, they usually run one Compulsive, okay. I see. Yep. But I do like... 
I do like that actually because that that tells me that he has figured out that his deck on turn three wants to evoke a Moldrifter more often than not, and yeah. so having the compulsive research is a better evoked Moldrifter. Okay, that's fair enough. All right, so moving on to third place is me. It's you. Yeah. So this deck is just total garbage. Never play it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I totally agree. It worked out very well for me. So as I said before, I, c I added the the seventeenth island because I just too many hands from mul were getting mulliganed, and cutting Cloudfin Raptors and Bone Splitters from the main deck, and I replaced them with uh, two excludes and a Logic Knot. How'd the Logic Knot pan out? I uh, it was more often not just a counter spell, which is very nice. Yeah. And exile a few cards from your graveyard. And what I found was that with all the times that I'm, you know, pondering and preordaining on turn one, and that logic not just more often than not had plenty of fuel to counterspell. It was I think it came awkward one time during the Swiss where I was up against Tron and it was a very late game and I top decked a logic knot, but uh it was fine, right? Usually if if I get to late game with Tron I'm dead anyway. Uh because they have a million mana out and they can do things like Mole Drifter and I just hope I have to hope that I have uh, the counter spell. So Logic Knot more often than not was just very good and it was a counter spell that didn't set me back on tempo. And that was what I was seeing a lot with Deprive was I was just losing so much tempo whenever I had to Deprive. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes Deprive I'm like, oh great, I'm actually really happy you did that. Yeah. Uh, the tempo setback is pretty huge. But more importantly, the excludes were just a godsend. Uh, I I definitely would not have made top 8 if it weren't for excludes. It's a good card. I mean, it's a very good card. Uh, not a card everyone can play. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, I love it as a 2 of in pretty much any blue deck. Yeah, it's just... Uh, I was up against... It, it just helped out so much in the Moldrifter matchups, right? Where they're like, okay, well... If I mold drifter him this turn, then he has to top deck counterspell again next turn to beat my next mold drifter. But if I exclude them, that just really wrecks their plans of trying to mold drifter me out. Because like, oh my god, he just excluded. Oh my god, that's the worst feeling in the world. Yeah, <laughs> any any creature, uh, t like when you're playing one of those games where, and not against Delver, but against Mono Blue Control, it's easiest to visualize. Where like on turn two, you play something, they counter it. Okay, well now, like, you're at parity in card size. So then next turn you play another spell, they counter it. Okay, you're still at parity. You know, like, this parity continues until you get excluded. And then right when that exclude happens, the parity is shifted immediately in their favor. They stay at the same card size, you go down one, and now it's an uphill battle for you the rest of the game. And it's yeah. that's a very powerful effect to have. And in your deck, more often than not, like, the, you're you're probably lower on cards in hand, but you're, like, way ahead in board presence. And so now this card, like, uh, stops them from gaining board presence and gives you another card to hopefully next turn stop them from gaining board presence. And that's just equally as huge of an effect. It's it's kind of like, a, you know, it's, it's like a, a bounce effect almost that where you draw a card, it's like... So it, it's it's a huge tempo hit in your di type of deck, and I'm surprised I don't see more excludes in non mezzel Delver type decks. Yeah. So deck deck performed amazingly for me, and I'm very happy that I went with uh, this iteration of it. That's for sure. Uh, and real quick to go over the rest of the top eight here before we close this out, uh, we've got another Esper Sage deck, Raging Flump, uh, Killabees, Mono Blue Control, which we've already talked about. Then we've got Vagar's Affinity, which he's running raises and standard bears in the sideboard. That's pretty sweet. I do actually have a question for you on uh, uh, the Unraging Flumps list. Okay. Why is he playing Seat of the Synod? I, you know, I don't know. I have no idea. Oh, you know why? It's because he has Divine Offering in his sideboard. So he can blow Wait, up no. his own land to gain nothing? Not Divine Offering, where is it? He did, was it? Not, I have no idea why he's playing Seed of the Synod. That doesn't make any sense. I thought it was because of Divine Offering, but uh, obviously not. 
<laughs> so, yeah, it just doesn't make any sense to me. Like, I, I don't think... I don't think having main deck artifact hate or something that can, like, you know, amount as artifact hate is a bad thing. And so then to just make it so that you can randomly get mized out by that seems very bizarre. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe he likes the art on them. <laughs> That's all I can figure. Yes. Uh, so then we already talked uh, talked about Killaby's Mono Blue Control. Yeah. And then we have uh, Vagar. Yeah, okay. Can you player be me? The, these Sun Chasers are surprisingly annoying. Um, and they must be a nod towards Delver. Generally, I hate them. But yeah. uh, I guess they worked for him today. Obviously, they did. Only one fling, though, which I can't agree with. Sorry, you yeah. need two flings in your deck. Uh, then we've got another Esper Sage player. Nothing really interesting about his list, I should say. And he doesn't have seats of the Synod, so it's not a normal <laughs> Yeah, so that's that's good. Good on him for not having seen the sign on. And then we finally got Jack Sad in eighth place, uh, running the same old Delver. Actually, Jack Sad modified this list a little bit. He's got boomerangs in the sideboard now. Uh, that boomerangs. must be for the uh, familiar storm matchup. Yes, it is. And if you ever boomerang a Kauri land, that th th this sucks so much for them. <laughs> Yeah, Delver's right. one of the few decks that can, like, take advantage of that type of tempo as well. Yeah, for sure. By the time you boomerang, like, if you turn to boomerang them, you could easily have four power out on the board. Five power if you turn one Delver, blind flip it, cloud of fairies, cloud of fairies, like, and then yeah. boomerang their land. <laughs> they <laughs> can't win dead. that. They're just dead. Uh, all right, so i got to close this out. Where can we get a hold of you, David? Uh, you can find me on Twitter. I'm Shafawafa5 there. Um, I do the ThoughtCast series at mtgostrat.com. Um, or you can find me on Magic Online, and I'm Shafawafa5 there as well. All right. I'm Chris. You can contact me on Twitter at Seaweaver8518. I write for Pure MTGO every week. Usually it's Popper. This week it's actually going to be Theros Block Constructed. But uh, find me on Pure MTGO every week. And then on Magic Online, I am C Weaver. You can get in contact with me there. Sorry if you guys have been getting in contact with me recently here. I've been very, very busy on Magic Online and you know juggling, you know the kids needing diaper changes and stuff like that. So I will have try to make more time for you guys if you contact me. And uh, that's about it. So thank you guys for listening. This has been Competitive Poppercast.